the media uploaded by LGBT Anonymous does not represent the Anonymous movement or the LGBT movement. They are just ideas that have been thought of as worth watching due to the fact that they promote the freeing of humanity in some way shape or form. If you would like to learn and grow with us then please subscribe, join our social networks and feel free to email us with content that you would like to see uploaded to our channel. We at LGBT Anonymous acknowledge and support all gender identities. My dad gets upset because they don't really teach science anymore in the public schools, and this is mostly because the right wing can't bear the thought of evolution. Um, my mom gets sad because they don't really teach history anymore, and my sister fairly weeps because you don't get art anymore in the school system. But me, I'm like, they just don't teach revolution anymore in those public schools. Am I right? Right? <laughs> So this is like the basic political education that really we all should have gotten and um, really most of us didn't. And I start here with liberals and radicals because I think this is the main division. Um, and I think this is important because a lot of times in our friendships, in our activist networks, and even in our groups, and across broader movements, there are these tensions that can be really painful and profound. And a lot of it really comes down to the difference between liberals and radicals. I, in the end, don't care which side of this you decide to land on. You, you got to figure out which, you know, which worldview actually describes the world as you know it, you know, and then that's up to you, really. But um, it can really help to understand where these different perspectives are coming from, because then when you have these conflicts, suddenly you go, right, that's liberal and I'm radical, and that's why we're never going to meet in the middle, because these are profound differences politically. Doesn't mean we can't work together. Lots of coalitions need to happen. I mean, I'm not trying to demonize anybody here, but these are different positions that people can take across the spectrum. So. Um, I would say the main division between liberals and radicals is um, individualism. Um, liberals believe that society is made up of individuals. That's the basic social unit. In fact, individualism is so sacrosanct that um, in this view, to be identified as a member of a group is seen as an affront. Okay, that's the insult. Um, totally different for radicals uh, over on the other side of the chart. Um, society is not made up of individual people. It's made up of <coughs> groups of people. And in Marx's original version, this was class. It was economic class. And this is the debt that all radicals owe Karl Marx. It doesn't matter if you're a Marxist or not. He figured this out. It's groups of people. And some groups have power over other groups. And that's what society is made of. Um, so in the radicals' understanding, being a member of a group is not an insult. In fact, it's the first sort of primary step you have to take. Um, coming to a radical consciousness and then ultimately having effective political action, you have to identify as a member of that group. You've got to make common cause with the people who share your condition. That's how political change happens. Um, and so this is both an active and a critical embrace of that group, group identity. I mean, we get accused, accused all the time you know, for radicals of creating these kind of victim identities, but that's not what's going on. We are more than what they've done to us, okay? And we do have agency, but... Um, yeah, we do have to recognize that there is power in the world and we're on the receiving end. Um, okay, the other big division um, is between the nature of social reality. So liberalism is what's called idealist. Um, social reality for them is made up of attitudes, of ideas. It's a mental event. Um, and therefore, social change happens through education, uh, through changing people's minds. Um, materialism, in contrast, over on the radical side, um, society is organized by concrete systems of power not by thoughts and ideas, by material institutions. And the solution to oppression is to take those systems apart brick by brick. So the liberals will say, we have to educate, educate, educate. And the radicals will say, actually, we have to stop them. Um, now, political movements need education. This is an educational event. Here we are. And you need active proselytizing. Um, the oppressed need mechanisms to understand uh, political oppression, consciousness raising. This is all just really profoundly important. But for radicals alone, that does not change social reality, okay? Because the world is not an internal state, okay? It's not a mental state. The point of education is to build a movement that can take down those oppressive structures and uh, bring about some kind of justice. So if you remove power from the equation, oppression looks either natural or voluntary. Right? If you're not going to see that people are formed by these social conditions, um, how else are you going to explain subordination? Well, either those people aren't quite human, so they're naturally different than us. That's why they're subordinate. Or they're somehow volunteering to be subordinate. That's the, sort of the options that you're left with. So, for instance, race and gender um, are seen as biological. These are supposed to be physically real. Well, they're not. They're politically real. Okay, and it's brutal, vicious subordination that creates those things. But it's ideology, and it's the ideology of the powerful that says this is biological. 
um, they make that claim, okay, that this is biological, because how are you going to fake, you know, fight God or nature or four million years of evolution? Well, you're not, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, there are physical differences between people who are from Northern Europe and people who live at the equator, just like there are differences between, between males and females, but those differences only matter because power needs them to. So it's power that creates the ideology, all right? And it's a corrupt and brutal arrangement of power. Um, these are unjust systems that we are going to have to dismantle, and these are social categories we are going to have to destroy. So, um, so just like nat naturalism operates in the service of power, so does voluntarism. Um, and if you're not going to go the biological route, all you're left with is voluntarism as a concept. So this is the thing that liberals do not understand. Uh, with power removed from the equation, if it looks voluntary, it, you're going to erase the fact that it's social subordination. So here's Florence Kennedy, um, without the consent of the oppressed. 90% of any oppression is consensual. That's what it does. Um, it does not mean it's our fault. It does not mean we're responsible. It doesn't mean that it will somehow crumble if we withdraw our consent. Um, all it means is that the powerful, so the capitalists, the white supremacists, the masculinists, whoever, they can't stand over vast numbers of people 24-7 with guns. Right? Luckily for them, depressingly for the rest of us, they don't have to. Um, people withstand oppression using three psychological methods. Um, oops, where's my button here? There. Here's Harriet. Denial, accommodation, and consent. So, if they had but known they were slaves. Anyone on the receiving end of domination learns early in life to stay in line or risk the consequences. And those consequences only have to be applied once in a while to be effective. From that point forward, the traumatized psyche will police itself. Um, we have a saying in the battered women's movement, one beating a year will keep a woman down. So once in a while is all it takes. Any show of resistance is met on a continuum that starts with derision, social derision, all the way across to violence, you know, including murder. Um, and that's how oppression works. Um, we end up consenting. But resistance does happen somehow. Despite everything, people will insist on their humanity. So here's Tank Man. I love this. I mean, we still don't know this man's name. We don't know if he's alive, but he did this. No, he, you know? he was killed. He was killed. Yeah, they're pretty sure he's killed. Because and he was pulled out of the street, but they don't know whether it was by police or whether it was by other citizens well, they, who were trying to yeah. save him. Because they were like, he's going to get murdered, and so they dragged yeah, well, him out. Yeah. Killed. killed. Yeah. It's a big mystery. Like it's still it's. We're not quite sure what happened to him in the end, but he said, over my dead body. I mean, it's quite clear. Um, and frankly, this is what we all need to be doing, right, in one way or another. Um, so the final difference here uh, between... I keep hitting the wrong button. I'm so sorry. The final difference um, is the approach to justice. And with power being invisible on the, the liberal side, justice is therefore served by adhering to these moral principles um, that are abstract. Now, for radicals, justice cannot be blind, all right? Domination will only be dismantled by taking away the rights of the powerful and redistributing it, those rights to the rest of us. So you're going to have to name the harm and then think of a specific redress and then go ahead and do it. Um, by having it be blind, um, it means that you're really only supporting the powers that be that are already in place. Um, you know, one really great example of this is um, there's a famous sex discrimination case. It was a class action suit against Sears and Roebuck. And um, women came forward, had a whole bunch of stories about how they were being denied promotions and whatnot in Sears, and um, this was heard by a federal court, and the federal court, and one of the problems was that women weren't getting maternity leave, and they said we're being discriminated against because we don't have maternity leave. The, one of the, and the court denied all their claims. Women, this was a huge loss. They lost this, and Walmart's doing the same thing now. I mean, it's, it has not changed in 30 years, okay? But the, the part that gets here always is the federal, the federal judge then says, this is not discrimination against women because if men got pregnant too, they also would not have maternity leave. Okay? This is a federal judge. Okay? You could not find a more abstract principle. Right? If men got pregnant, men don't get pregnant. That's the point. <laughs> That's why it's discrimination against women. So, okay. um, so here we've been using these words like oppression. We haven't defined this yet. So if you did your readings, you will have come across Marilyn Fry. A system of interrelated forces and barriers which reduce, immobilize, and mold people who belong to a certain group and affect their subordination to another group. Now, that is radicalism in one elegant sentence. Um, oppression is not an attitude. It's about a system of power. Um, and one of the harms of that system is that it creates subordination in that group. So it, it creates that consent in the oppressed. Um, and the image that she uses is the birdcage. So if you're a liberal, you're only going to see sort of random bars. They're not connected into that interrelated 
set, right? What keeps that bird in that cage is the fact that all those bars work together, okay? It's the interrelated forces and barriers. So if you're the liberal, why is that bird in that cage? Well, I don't know. There's nothing keeping that bird in that cage. You don't see the forces and barriers. Um, so it either has to be voluntary, the bird wants to be in the cage, or it's natural. Well, it's just that bird's nature to be in that cage. Um, so then we've got another word here we should talk about, which is subordination. And we got some very smart people who've come before us. <laughs> uh, this is Andrew Dworkin, Four Elements of Subordination. Hierarchy, group on top, group on the bottom. Of course, the people on the bottom have a lot fewer rights, resources, blah, blah. Objectification. So uh, some human beings are seen as less than human in whatever way. They are used as objects. They are bought and sold as objects. They are, you know, it's appropriate to treat them as objects. Submission. So here we go again. Uh, you have to submit in order to survive. And this is always the rock and the hard place right? that you're up against when you're being oppressed. Um, and so you're objectified. And because you then have to submit, that's used as proof that you, in fact, deserved that oppression or you're somehow made for that oppression. It doesn't hurt you when you oppress. But in fact, it's really just the only option you've got if essentially you don't want to die. Um, and then finally is violence. So of course, committed by the people on top against the people on the bottom is totally natural. In fact, they have a right to do it. It's when people start fighting up from the bottom that you've got trouble. So all four of these elements work together to create this like hermetically sealed world, um, psychologically and politically, where oppression is normalized and it's almost like as necessary as air for the whole society to function. So coming to political consciousness is not a painless task. To overcome that denial, the accommodation, the consent, it means facing the everyday normative cruelty in, of the society in which you live, in which millions of people are participating in this. A lot of them get direct benefits from it. Other of them get benefits as bystanders. But um, it's really hard to face that. It's also really hard to face your own collusion and your own oppression. It's not a fun moment. A friend of mine remembers um, her first, first person in her, in her uh, family who went to college, grew up in really extreme poverty. And her first year in college, um, she kind of had a mental breakdown, and it was over this, this one sentence. She said, I realized there were rich people and there were poor people, and there was a relationship between the two. Right? So that whole year was just coming to grips with that. Um, but knowledge of oppression starts from some kind of baseline recognition that subordination is always wrong, that oppression always hurts real people, and that we can do something about it. Um, and I, I would submit that that, um, that knowledge and the skills that we acquire in analyzing you know, the situation that we're in can be emotionally freeing, certainly intellectually freeing, and ultimately spir spiritually freeing. I mean, it can give us the kind of courage that we need to go forward. So we got to do it. <laughs>once people realize that you know bad things are happening most of us are called to action um, and I would say these are the four main categories of response now the, the take-home point here if you remember nothing else from this the take-home point here is that all four of these categories um, can be either liberal or radical they, none of them are inherently liberal or radical um, it depends how we use them they all have strategic strengths they all have strategic failings so it depends what we want to do with them um, so this is the realization to which radicalism brings you. My two favorite people again. Social change requires force. Why? Because it's not a mistake, out of which the powerful can be educated. Um, don't misunderstand me that when I say force, that does not have to equal violence. Whether or not to wage your struggle using violence or nonviolence is a decision that comes way later, you know, way down the pike. Um, Nonviolence is a very elegant political technique if it's understood and used properly. I don't think that it is being used properly on the left right now, but, um, th but this is not a division between violence and nonviolence. It is only to recognize that power is not a mistake. I mean, not unless you're a liberal. Um, again, if you want to be a liberal, great. Um, that that's the framework that works for you. It's your decision. I mean, really, some of my best friends, right? <laughs> um, so. <laughs> Back to our category. So the first one is legal for obvious reasons. I mean, a lot of activist groups, you know, really focus on making legal changes to the social social power, um, and that's you know to quote Catherine McKinnon, law organizes power. So it makes sense that a lot of us are sort of gravitate to that. The trick is we got to do that as radicals and not as liberals. So you know, basic question: Does this initiative, whatever it is, does it redefine power? Not just who's at the top of the of the pyramid, but does it actually redefine power? Does it take power away from the powerful and redistribute it such that we all have? some control over the material conditions. Um, that would make it a radical action. Okay, um, But a lot of people, they give up on the legal stuff or it doesn't appeal for whatever reason. Direct action, also tried and true. Um, you can totally bypass the legislative arena, legis legislative arena and get a lot done. 
Um, usually it's some kind of civil disobedience. I mean, it can be letter writing, petitioning, some kind of pressure, but it really kicks into gear when you sort of hit, hit them economically. Great examples, the Montgomery bus boycott. You know, they, they, it was not a legal campaign. It was, we're going to hit them economically, and they did. They brought the bus company to their knees and made them stop segregating the buses. So it can be very effective. Um, your basic insurrection would be another good example of direct action. So that covers a lot of ground, you know, from very liberal things through very successful movements on up to really profound change. Um, number three is withdrawal. Now this is a tricky one. The main difference between withdrawal as a successful strategy and withdrawal as a failed strategy is whether that withdrawal is seen as adequate in itself or whether it's, it's seen as necessary uh, connected to a larger political struggle. struggle. Um, and that distinction hinges exactly on the difference between liberal and radical um, because issues of identification and loyalty are crucial to resistance movements, but they're not enough, right? because your emotional state is not actually what's going to create political change. So the withdrawal has to go beyond the intellectual, beyond the emotional, beyond the psychological. It's got to include a goal of actually winning justice by withdrawing. Um, withdrawal may give solace, um, but ultimately it will change nothing. Living in a rarefied bubble world of the already converted is a very poor substitute for freedom, and it will not save our planet. So um, this is Gene Sharp, who I think is marvelous. And you should like, go to the library, get every book he's ever written. It'll keep you busy for a year. Um, but he makes a very similar point. And the people that he calls utopians, I would call withdrawalists. But they're often especially sensitive to the evils of the world. They crave certainty and purity. They reject the evil as firmly as possible. They don't want to have any compromise. And they await this new world which will come into being by either an act of God, a change in human spirit, autonomous changes in conditions, some kind of spontaneous upheaval, but all of these are beyond deliberate human control. Now the most serious weakness of this response to the problem of this world is not the broad vision or the commitment of the people who believe in it. The weakness is that these believers have no effective way to reach the society of their dreams. That about sums up my youth. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've heard the phrase secular millennialism, and that's exactly what he's getting at. So the left has these vague notions, right? That our actions will inspire others, that even more vaguely these will accumulate into some kind of meaningful social change or kick off a spontaneous insurrection. And there's a nonviolent version, which is usually lifestyle stuff like diet. Um, there's the more militant actions like the weather underground. And those are the two poles of secular millennialism. Change will happen because it must, or because you know, the great turning narrative says it will, or because you know, the fires of our righteous rage will make it be so. Given that revolution is not actually inevitable, um, I think we would be wise to understand the basic principle of resistance. Dislodging injustice requires, in the words of Andrew Dworkin, organized political resistance. So this brings us to the next category, which is spirituality. Um, Withdrawal of stance is usually based on despair, um, but it's an answer that relies on faith, all right? um, not on strategy, which is, which is to say it's an emotional response, um, emotional solution, and it's not a material solution. So this merges right into millenarianism. Now, millenarianism is any religious movement that predicts the collapse of the world order as we know it to be replaced by this wonderful time of justice and whatnot. Um, the lots of examples across history of desperate people taking this up. Um, I highly recommend reading up on this, much of the left has been infected by this kind of thinking. We're going to meditate to stop global warming. We're going to orgasm our way to peace. Um, if all else fails, which it will, December 2012 is coming up, right? How many of these have we lived through? I'm 46. I think I've lived through four. You know, every 10 years, there's another one, right? Uh, it's not, it's not going to happen. Um, the worst examples in history that we know of, the Zosha cattle killing cult. Um, the Zosha are cattle herding people in eastern South Africa in the 1700s. There's various colonial invasions, displacement, um, you know, genocide, war, all these horrors. It, by 1854, there's this terrible lung disease, and a whole bunch of the cattle die. So the people are just incredibly vulnerable at this point. And somebody has a vision. A teenage girl has a vision. And the vision is if we kill all the cattle, if we destroy all our food stocks, even our cooking pots, everything, then this great thing will happen. The dead are going to return. The food supplies will just spring up overnight. There's going to be gigantic cattle that you've never even seen before. They're so big. And, they will, every, and, and the spirit warriors will drive the British out, and we will have our land again. So this vision starts to spread. Everybody starts having visions. It's just like this mass visioning is happening everywhere. People believe it. More people believe it. They start killing the cattle. Um, at, so, at some point, so many cattle are killed that the carrion birds can't even keep up with it. There's so many corpses rotting in the sun. 400,000 beasts are slaughtered by the end of this. Um, the first deadline comes. Does anything happen? 
One guess, no. And of course the unbelievers are blamed. This is always where it ends with this kind of millennialism. It's your fault because you didn't believe it. So the very last cattle have to be killed. A few people are hanging on. No, I'm just going to keep this one cow for some milk. You can't do it. So every last cattle has to be killed. Um, so what happens? Mass starvation ensues. Um, all its attendants and atrocities and horrors. People ate corpses. People ate grass. People ate their children. I mean, it's just absolute hell. The population at one point was 105,000, and it collapses to 26,000 people, a lot of whom had to escape into cities because they were just starving in the countryside. 150 years of imperialism could not defeat the, the Zosha, but two years of millennial fever almost did. So bad example. Uh, the Boxer Rebellion is another one, just as horrible. They called themselves the Righteous Harmony Society. This was a religious society in northern China that was a, a, you know, absolutely a response to the opium wars and British imperialism. You get why people are desperate, you know. Um, so they did martial arts, diet and prayer, and they believed they would be given the power to fly if they did this. And absolutely, they had special garments, protection against bullets and swords. You find that theme a lot. You're going to wear the special garment and they won't be able to kill you. So uh, there was going to be an army of spirit soldiers that was going to arrive to save the day and drive out the British. Um, they never appeared. The entire thing ends in complete disaster for China. Um, very evil stuff. So um, you know how the British responded was just appalling. Um, anyway, uh, two examples, and it, it is really worth, I think, Knowing more about this, because I just see these tendencies all the time, and it's not going to end well for us either. Divine intervention has never yet stopped a system of unjust power across the entire sweep of human history. Okay, as a political strategy, it is a complete failure, and we really need to get over this one. This is not in any way to dismiss the role of spirituality in a resistance movement. I mean, spirituality is so often the core of any culture, and it is often um, the kind of the cradle of the resistance movement. I mean, a lot of people talk about the black churches as the beginning of the civil rights movement, the anti-apartheid movement. Also, the churches plays a huge role. I mean, all across the world, you can find how, you know, the Tibetans and the Buddhism, how this all comes together. It gives people incredible dignity and strength. You can get yourself respect through your spiritual practice. It absolutely helps communities stay together under really brutal conditions, helps set community norms. All that is incredibly important. Um, my point really is that faith is not a political strategy. Um, the only miracle that we're going to get is us.